Jim Rogers, a legendary man in a world of investment and trading, co-founder of the Quantum Fund. Welcome to the show. It's really great to have you with us. I am delighted to be here, Sophie. Welcome to Moscow. All right, Jim, so a mess for both the American and the world economy. That's what you've predicted. What is it going to be like? Is it going to be just as bad as 2008? No, Sophie, it's going to be much worse. You should watch RTTV. Tell me. It's going to be much worse. We had a problem in 2008 because the debt was very, very high. Now the debt is much, much higher all over the world. Next time we have a problem, it's going to be worse than 2008. You should be very worried. You should be very knowledgeable, and you should get prepared. I'm not as knowledgeable as you are in sure you're better. questions of economy and finance, so tell me how bad are we talking about? I mean, you've been talking about this impending recession for a while now, uh, ready to strike the United States, for instance, but, you know, we see American economy picking up, the unemployment rate is going down, so why does why it, it keep postponing itself? Wait, 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 wait. First of all, you, you listen to government figures. You remember the Soviet Union? The government had a lot of numbers that were very good. The United States now puts out a lot of figures that are not legitimate, accurate figures. They look at, you look at unemployment, what they do, for instance, they just stop counting many people, say they're not looking for a job anymore. So the numbers are artificial in the United States. Yes, some parts of the U.S. economy are doing very well. If you're on Wall Street or if you're in finance, you're doing fine because the government has been printing a lot of money and a lot of debt has been put out. But you go to Texas, go to North, go to the Midwest. They're not doing well at all. The, most of the country is not doing well. All right, but give me something concrete. When do we have to expect this crisis to heat and what's going to cause that meltdown? Sophie, for the last uh, 18, 18 months in the United States, most stocks have been going down. The averages are up because of a few big companies that make the average go up, and that's because the government, the Federal Reserve, Central Bank is printing a lot of money. Stocks are going down in the United States. Most stocks are down. So the signs are already there. Now, unfortunately, they're not visible. They don't make headlines. So it's already happening. Parts of the country are in recession. Stock market, most stocks are going down. It's already happening. So, um if you look at the efforts of the world's financial planners and central bankers, I mean, their efforts to invigorate the economy are really working. What is working? What could work um, without the government interference? Without the government interference, wouldn't that be wonderful? Then we might, we probably would have been finished with the problems of 2008 or 9. But the, most Americans will tell you that the economy is not better now. Their lives are not better than they were in 2008 or even 2005. Most Americans do not have a better life for a long, long, long time. If you ask me what to do, well, <laughs> first of all, you should, you should have the federal, you should abolish the Federal Reserve. Now. America's had three central banks in our history. The first two disappeared. You can get along without a central bank, as we have. This central bank is a disaster. They've been printing a lot of money. They've been running up staggering amounts of debt. So the first thing we need to do is either abolish the central bank, which is unlikely, or tell them to stay out of the way. Tell them to stop printing money. Tell them to stop building up the debt. That's the problem in the U.S. Sophie. The United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Not the largest in the world, the largest in the history of the world, and the debt is getting worse. This is not a good situation. So you're thinking abolishing the central bank is going to improve the situation on the market? This particular central bank. Now, the world without central banks has problems, too. But this central bank is making all of our lives much worse, and the next crisis and the one after that, if we survive the next one, it's going to be really, really bad. And what you asked before what that means, that means bankruptcies, that means currency turmoil, that means stock markets dropping a whole lot, that means interest rates going much higher. It won't be fun. I just wonder, how many crises have you seen in your lifetime? I mean, I'm aren't old. they all the same? I mean, you always get bankrupt and you always... Uh... Well, but, but there's, America was a creditor nation in my lifetime. When I was a kid, America was a creditor nation. But since 1987, America's become a debtor nation. And now, listen, we're good at America. In 40 years, 30 years, we've become the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. We went so from are a the creditor. crises getting worse and worse yes, 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 as yes. your life progresses? Yes, yes, yes. That's because of me. I guess because <laughs> I'm getting older. I'm causing the problems. So That's you also it. said that um, when economic troubles arise, 
it inevitably leads to a war. Now, we see some major world powers, and they're all in economic crisis. Are we doomed to yeah, you would watch see RT. war happen? Yeah, don't you see war happening? What kind of war do you see? Well, I hope, I mean, I hope it continues. World today is very different from world 20 years ago or 50 years ago. So what kind of world well, do you see? We certainly see? hope we don't see World War III. We certainly hope. Unfortunately, mankind, for whatever reason, mankind throughout history is always coming up with big wars. Let's hope it continues to be proxy wars. I mean, you, you know about Afghanistan. You know what's been going on in the world. You know what the Americans did in Ukraine. But that's and kind then of been going on forever. It's not a new thing. I mean, countries change, but locations change, these, but the logistics don't change. The reason these things are going on is because economic hard times are all around the world. Japan is in recession. Japan is one of the largest economies in the world. They, the Japanese government will tell you they're in recession. Several European countries are in recession. We have hard times in many parts of the world, and that's one of the reasons we're having strife. The whole Middle East. In, in the last 10 years, the whole Middle East, nearly every country, probably every country, has had some kind of major crisis. This is all because the world economy is bad well, and no. debt is building up. We keep also hearing about a major crisis in China, but their growth still stands at 7%, which is pretty impressive. Should we really be worried? Well, I don't, I don't hear about a major crisis in China. Uh, I'm, China's in better shape than most countries these days. It does not mean China's not going to have problems. Just to say that some people like to blame China's slowdown on world's economic problems. I know, and they, and they try to blame Russia on Ukraine. You know, some people try to do all sorts they do. of things. You know, they do. They do. You know, well, you know, it's absurd. And some people listen to some of these. A third uh, propaganda is unbelievable all over the world. China, is a, China trades with most of the world. Japan's in recession. It's one of their major customers. If your major customer's in recession, you're going to suffer too. Korea's one of them. Korea's having problems. Many parts of Europe are having problems. So when your customers have problems, of course you have problems. You can't blame it on China. China's the victim. But it doesn't matter. It's, we're all in it together, Sophie, and we're all going to, we all are suffering, and we're all going to suffer more in the future. But I'm thinking back in 2008, China was in a really, really good shape. So it was doing the heavy lifting when the crisis hit the world. Who's going to be doing the heavy lifting this time around when the Luba, crisis comes? Luba, Luba, well done, yes. Uh, what happened in 2008, China didn't have much debt. They had a lot of money saved up for a rainy day. It started raining. They started spending the money. This time, Sophie, China has a lot of debt itself. It's astonishing that China's built up so much debt in just the last eight years. So China's not going to be able to help as much this time as they did last time. Who's going to have do the heavy lifting? You tell me. I told you, be worried and be prepared. There's nobody left. The central banks are going to print as much as they can. The governments in the U.S. and other places are going to spend as much as they can. But eventually the market's going to say, we don't want your garbage anymore. You're printing all this paper money. You're borrowing all, you're putting out all these bonds. No, no, we're not going to take it anymore. Well, I remember last year, President Obama said that U.S. should be writing the rules of the global economy and not China. Well, first of all, um, are there any rules in global economy? And who is really to take the lead, if not China? Can America do the heavy lifting? <laughs> Well, America will for the most part because many people think that America is still the dominant economy. It is the largest economy in the world. So but it is, objectively speaking, still, right? It, it's the largest economy in the world right now. Object to any measure you want to use, yes. But it's also the largest debtor nation in the world. And, and most of the growth in the past few years has been based on debt. Sophie. You give me a trillion dollars, I'll give you a very good time. You and I will have so much fun if you give me a few trillion dollars. But the hangover, the headache, is going to be so horrible because somebody has to pay for this and America's debt is going through the roof. So yes, America's leading the world economy, but it's all based on printed money and borrowed money. And it's in the end, it's going to be a disaster for all of us. So, obviously, when the crisis hit, uh, people tend to look for safe haven. And a lot of people still think that safe haven is the dollar. They like to save their money in dollars, not in euros, not in yens or rubles, in dollars. You don't think so. Why not? Why isn't I actually safe? own a lot of U.S. dollars just because of what you said. Because everybody thinks that the U.S. dollar is a safe haven. It's not. America is the largest debtor nation in world history. But people think 
it's a still a safe haven and they want to they're not going to buy the euro as you said they're not going to not going to buy the ruble they're not going to buy the other currencies in the world so they're going to float flee to the US dollar my largest currency position is the US dollar so what I do you need them for are you just going to sell them when the times are better that's my plan i hope <laughs> i get it right you know then we'll have a really good time if if the dollar goes up like i think it will Hopefully, I'll be smart enough to sell my U.S. dollars as it gets overpriced, could even turn into a bubble, and then I got to do something with my money. When do you think that'll happen? Later this year, or next year. Oh, so it's like a close perspective. Yeah, this is 2016. I told you to be worried, <laughs> to get prepared. And by the way, I just want you to know. Speaking of currencies, last week, week, week before last, I bought. Russian government bonds in rubles. Wait, wait, wait. We'll, we'll talk. We'll get to the Russian okay. bonds. But first, um, we see foreign governments actually dumping uh, U.S. debt at a record rate. Why do we see this diminished appetite from overseas oversights? Do do they just need the cash? Sophie, I'm not the only person who knows that the U.S. is the largest debtor in history, and the debt's going higher and higher. Other co countries need it, but many of them need the money. Russia needs money these days. You know, China's trying to cut down its dependence on the United States. China's entire, nearly entire foreign currency reserve. Well, I was going to say China and Japan, uh, I mean, they own trillions in American treasuries. Yes. Even Russia has increased its investment in U.S. debt. Do they not sense the trouble? Do they not see that it's the biggest uh, debtor nation debtor in the nation history of the world? Or, yeah. Well, the Japanese need money. They're in recession. Many countries need money. But the holdings of U.S. government debt is declining. You're right. More and more people, for whatever reason, are reducing their whole governments, are reducing their holdings of U.S. government debt, and they're wise. All right, Jim, we're going to take a short break right now. Hold your thought there. When we come back, we'll continue discussing the world's economic outlook with Jim Rogers, businessman, author, investor. Stay with us. We're back with Jim Rogers, U.S. investor, businessman, discussing the state of the world's economy and what it means for us. Uh, so U.S. dollar is slowly forfeiting its position, right? Um, could something else take its place? How well, soon could it happen? What could it be? Some, we need something to compete with the U.S. dollar because it is a, a flawed, terribly flawed currency. Now, you look around the world, there's nothing on the horizon except possibly the renminbi. Renminbi is a huge economy. It's not a huge debtor like many other countries. So the renminbi is the only one I can see. Now, the renminbi is not convertible, so it's an absurd statement. But it is becoming more and more convertible, more and more freely tradable. And as that happens, it's the only country, currency that I can see they will replace the U.S. dollar or begin to compete with the U.S. dollar. It takes a long time to get rid of old currencies. But right now, as we speak, what is safe in terms of commodities? Is gold safe, for instance? I own gold. I hope I still have it here. Yeah, I, I have gold. Can I have it? You can look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Just to prove to you I have, I have gold. Um, I even have some Russian gold in here. Nice coin. Okay, yes, Russian gold. Um, so I own some gold, but I'm not buying gold now. I haven't bought gold in a while. I expect a better chance to buy gold sometime in the next year or two. If the dollar goes up, gold may go down. Uh, but if it goes down, I hope to buy a lot more gold because eventually gold is going to go through the roof. As this turmoil increases and people lose more and more confidence in governments, more and more confidence in paper money, they're going to look for something. And gold, we want gold and silver, will be a couple of those places. If you're looking for something right now, agriculture. Wait, Sophie, do you... Well, yeah, you believe that the future is in agriculture, that farmers are the billionaires of the future. But why farming? I mean, it does seem like it's a step back in history, no, rather than the other way around. Sophie, there have been Just like going back to gold or going back to typewriters because everything's okay. wired and Sophie, they only save ways you, to typewrite things. Do you know how to drive a tractor? No, I don't. I, no, you don't. I don't yeah. even have a driving license, Jim. Really? Yeah. Not even for a car? No. Motorcycle? No. Oh, my gosh. 
I don't know if I've ever met I'm anybody. I'm your kind of girl. I'm yeah. the old-fashioned type. Yeah. You are the old-fashioned type. So tell wow. me, why farmers? Fantastic. Why are they the future billionaires? Sophie, for many periods in history, we've had when the farmers, when the agriculture people were on top, followed by people when the financial types and others were on top, going back to the farmers and people who produce real goods. This has been going on for thousands of years. All these cycles come and go. Now, agriculture has been a horrible business for 30 years. The average age of farmers in America is 58. In Japan, it's 66. In Canada, it's the oldest in recorded history. The highest rate of suicide in the UK is in agriculture. Millions of Indian farmers come. This is a terrible business, horrible business, and it has been for over 30 years. More people in America study public relations than study agriculture. So where is the future in agriculture? Well, you're supposed to buy low. Didn't your par parents teach you to buy low and sell high? Agriculture is the disaster. Now, either some, it's going to get better, or we're not going to have any clothes or any food at any price. And the turn is coming. Agriculture in Russia, for instance, right now is becoming very, very exciting, very, very profitable. You should go out and learn to drive a tractor. I'm telling you. I might. I might. I'm telling you after this interview. Okay. I don't want to be left without clothes. <laughs> I know, so. God. Me neither. Our food. I want you. To. And where are we going to get our vodka? I know. I mean, for goodness sake. I'm going to. I'm going to learn how to drive a tractor after this. I it promise. will be a crisis if you. All right. So tell me, uh, in broader terms, where should be people looking to invest geographically? Well, I have started. Whether it's agriculture or I, my, business I have, or I, I have sold short the United States, and I have sold short the stocks in the United States, and I have sold short uh, junk bonds, uh, low-grade bonds in the United States. I own shares in China. I bought more, I, I have shares in Russia. I bought Russian government bonds uh, several days ago. These are places that I'm looking. I'm looking at Kazakhstan as a place to invest. Iran I'm looking at. Nigeria I'm looking Tell at. Tell me about Iran. Tell me about Iran, because, you know, it's out of the international isolation. I mean, it's a huge untapped market. Yes. Very young, a hu very, you know, something like two thirds of the people are under 35 years old. It's a very young country with lots of people, over 70 million people. Well, where exactly should they be investing in Iran? In what fields? Any, well, you can invest in oil if you want to, but I wouldn't. But that's you, obvious. Yeah, what else? if you invest in, in Iran or you're investing in oil, whether you want to or not, anything. They've been under sanctions for a long time, they want everything. Tablecloths, soap, you know, you figure whatever you know about, you go to Iran and invest in those things or buy shares on the Iranian stock market. It's still difficult for me as an American. So you should go there before the Americans get there. It's wonderful for you. You're a Russian. Yeah, you I couldn't beat them in Cuba, right? <coughs> well, you don't have to compete with the Americans in Iran. When they get there, then you've got to compete with the Americans. But talk to me about Russia. I mean, you, you keep saying that, you, you, you know, you, you like to invest here, but the ruble is losing its value, and the general opinion is that it's not a good place to invest. Why is it good to invest in Russia right now? Sophie, the Russian stock market is the most hated stock market in the world. Not only the stock market, Jim. <laughs> What else? The country? The women? <laughs> what are you talking about? Anyway, I like to invest in unpopular places, unpopular stock markets. I have learned in my career that if you invest in things which everybody dislike and hate, you're probably going to be very well off two, three, five years later. That these things, I mean, I can remember just about every country which has been very depressed at times. If you buy it, it turns around. So you expect the ruble to rebound? It already has started rebounding. It's rebounded. Uh, I expect that the ruble will probably not go down. The ruble is in the process of making a bottom. Even, even if, well, oil is in the process of making a bottom, therefore the ruble. But the, Russia now has things which are replacing oil. Agriculture is booming in the Soviet, in Russia, Soviet Union, in Russia now for many reasons. Some artificial, but some real. So there are other things that are going to replace oil in the future so, in Russia. Yeah, well, oil. Um you said in January that oil prices haven't hit the rock bottom yet, but now they're rising. And should we expect them to fall again? Well, the prices did go down dramatically after I said that, and they did hit a bottom. What normally happens, Sophie, is things go down. We have a big drop. It hits a bottom. And then what we call in America a dead cat bounce. It bounces like that. So what's going to happen now? I mean, it's the uh, first I mean, yeah. finish. It, you have the dead cat bounce, and then it goes back. It tests the lows, 
and then that then it then it's the end. It's usually the the end of the of the big collapse, and then it goes like that, and then it starts going up again. So, so that's what's going to happen. So, so where with are we at right now? We, we're at we're, the we're, first we've had hike. The, we had the big dead cat bounce. Okay. We're probably going to now have some co correction to go back. We may may go higher, but we'll probably go back for a while lower. Fill around, test the bottom. That'll be the bottom, and then two or three years from that, be higher again. So the rebound is two and three years. It's sooner, probably late, later this year or next. But I'm thinking cheap Listen, oil. Tesla, I want to tell you one thing, Sophie. I'm the world's worst market timer. I'm the world's worst short-term trader. So I don't know. Uh, you watch RT, and you can find out the exact timing of these things. I am terrible at it. Okay. You're just like a good clairvoyant, because when they predict the future, they say right away, we're good, but we can't see the time. You know? well, I didn't know that's what they said. I'll use that's them, too. That's what they say. And that's what they say. Well, okay. So, but back to the oil. I'm thinking cheap oil is actually good for a global economy. No, isn't cheap energy a driving factor for growth in like giant countries like China or India? It's absolutely. There are more people who consume energy than, than produce energy. There's no question about that. It is better for all of us. But in the meantime, other many people are suffering. Russia, Nigeria, many people are suffering with lower energy prices. But overall, the world is better off with low energy prices. So what do you think uh, is in store for the emerging economies like Brazil, India? Well, there are many, many emerging economies, so there's no generalization. Uh, I, you Who can, will take the lead? Who do you think will take the lead? Coming out of this? Yeah. China. China's going to next great China country. China isn't quite an emerging economy. I'm talking about the emerging big economies. Okay, well, first of all, I want you to know China's the next great country in the world. The 19th century was the century of the UK. The 20th century was the century of the US. The 21st century is what's going to be the century of China. So, you should t you have children? We'll have soon. Okay. Oh, Harry Show. Uh, Luba, then be sure your children learn Mandarin because it's going to be an extremely important language in their lifetime. I have two girls. They both speak man, both speak perfect Mandarin because I'm preparing them for the 21st century. Now, you say it's not an emerging market. Okay. Who, which of the emerging I mean, not markets? anymore. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, that's, it doesn't matter. That's a, 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 a statement which is acceptable. Uh, I don't, let's see. Conceivably, Russia will help uh, pull us out of all of this. Uh, certainly not Brazil. Kazakhstan, amazing things are happening, amazing changes, positive changes are taking place in Kazakhstan. Amazing positive things are happening in Nigeria, not Brazil. India? Uh, well, <laughs> if you can only visit one country in your lifetime, Sophie, go to India. But it's not a good place to invest, not with my money anyway. It's got the world's worst bureaucracy, many reasons to, I mean, it's a wonderful... Why is it in Russia? Yeah, I mean, the, the Indians learned bureaucracy from the English, and then they took it to a higher plane. They made it, now listen, Russian bureaucracy. They took bureaucracy, it to a whole new level, huh? A whole new level, the high, high, I mean, it's astonishing what the Indians can do. But, you know, I mean, Russian bureaucracy is, is a nightmare. There's no question about that. You should have been here under the Soviets. Oh, my God, was it a, was it a nightmare. It's getting better, but it's still bad. You're right. Well done. I want to talk a bit about the upcoming elections. Donald Trump is doing so impressively well. I mean, who would have thought he may even get the Republican nomination? Who knows? He, he may might win. even make it to the White House. He might win, yes. So it will be the first time we'll have a businessman at the helm of a state. Do, do you think that will change anything? Having a businessman being a president? If Donald Trump does what he says he's going to do, we're going to have trade wars with lots of people, such as China, such as Mexico, probably Russia, who knows that. And trade wars have always led to bankruptcy and often led to war. So if Mr. Trump does what he says he's going to do, I've told you to be worried. If Mr. Trump wins and does what he says, you better be panicked because the world is really going to fall apart this absolute disaster, worse than I'm even telling you might happen, and we might even have big wars at that point. So, now, one thing about it, Sophie, you have job security, because journalists have to report it. Somebody has to report to us what's going on, and if this is all very bad, which, he, which will happen if he does what he says, it's going to be really, really, it's going to be a terrible world. I worry about my little girls in that world.